Jeffrey Can, and you're listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled Move Bits, Not Molecules, Transforming Freight Using Digital. There must be an enormous amount of freight haulage to Fort McMurray for the oil and gas industry. So could the industry extract some costs from that freight movement and cut some carbon at the same time through digital? Regular listeners to this podcast know that I devote my energies towards more broad and sweeping analysis of the potential of digital to impact the oil and gas sector. But this podcast will take a slightly different tack and will bear down on a very specific function, heavy freight movements in support of the oil and gas industry. And while my comments reference Canada's oil sands, my conclusions apply equally to the offshore sectors and to other concentrated basins of activity. I'm not wrong in asserting that tons of freight travel north to Fort Mac. Just 10 years ago, there were only six oil sands mines. Now, there are 11. The mining side of the industry has almost doubled in size and scale. Numerous in situ bitumen players have entered and expanded their operations, adding to the highway freight load. Throw in the infrastructure players, that is pipelines, tank farms, and power plants. And of course, there's little to no local manufacturing of industrial kit, so it's all trucked in. Traffic on the highway has clearly grown, the weather has not improved, the recent fires highlight new risks, and it's still one of Alberta's more dangerous commutes. A few years ago, when the oil sands sector was much smaller than it is today, one of my colleagues helped one of the oil sands mines take a look at its trucking bill. They were spending close to $1 billion per year. The whole thing was spectacularly inefficient. No one was in charge of freight and everyone seemed empowered to commission urgent shipments from Edmonton or Niskew. We sorted through the lanes, consolidated the carriers, rationalized the rates, and began tracking the less-than-truckload stats, and trimmed the urgent runs, and it wasn't long before the costs of shipping began to fall. Well, with the oil downturn, I'm pretty sure the sector has a whole, as a whole has a basic grasp of its freight area. It's costly enough, and the sector copies good ideas quickly. But the problem is that all these basic productivity improvements were undertaken before the wave of digital enablement that has swept through the industry. And as well, there hasn't really been any capital availability in the past three years for something like logistics. But the digital building blocks to rethink freight logistics aren't all now in place. First, it's a pretty good bet that every employee in the freight business has at least one supercomputer in their genes. We call them smartphones, but even the Apple Watch has doubled the compute horsepower of a Cray supercomputer from the 1990s. Next, the cost of sensors has tumbled by 95% since 2008. The best carriers have GPS tracking in their trucks to give them visibility to where the loads are. It's not science fiction that the pallets, crates, and containers could also have their own sensors broadcasting location and condition. Third is cloud computing. It's now sufficiently advanced and low cost that we can think about system level optimization and new business models that could leverage the enormous quantities of data that all the sensors, humans, and trucks generate. Next, artificial intelligence tools can help make sense of all that data, from helping to manage the flow of trucking on the highway to optimizing what gets hauled. And finally, 3D printing costs have tumbled. 10 years ago, the least expensive 3D printer cost $18,000. Today, the least expensive printer is just $400 and is 100 times faster. Why haul it if you can just make it cheaply on site? Just because there's no manufacturing today doesn't mean it needs to remain that way. Innovation in oil logistics would make a lot of sense to me. <clears throat> if we assume the goal is to reinvent logistics through digital, where would you start? Well, how about applying artificial intelligence to the enormous data pile of what is shipped by all the oil sands companies? AI could more quickly figure out that two differently named products are in fact the same thing by comparing their specifications. I suspect artificial intelligence could help point to where Pareto principles play out. 80% of the items shipped represent just 20% of the cost, or 80% of shipping costs are attributable to just 20% of the items, or 20% of all items attract 80% of the urgent shipping costs, or 80% of the items are common across all the operations. The oil sands companies could easily undertake this kind of analysis through their trade associations or the university sector or through crowdsourcing or by hiring some independent analytics. Next would be to invest in some 3D printing. Artificial intelligence can then guide what could be reliably printed on site and not shipped at all. Since 3D printing can make both plastic and metal parts from 3D design files, the industry could start with some easy to make items like couplings, insulators, jackets, and tools 
before moving on to more metal parts. 3D printing brings more benefits than just some avoided shipping cost. Early adopters report shorter lead times, less scrap and less material usage, lighter parts, a reduction in inventories, less complex manufacturing, smaller land footprint, and the ability to make parts with complex shapes and geometries. 3D printing is also an electricity-driven process, which, under the right conditions, could be fed from renewable sources and, as a result, lower carbon emissions. Some industries, like aircraft makers, the military, and running shoe companies, are actively exploiting 3D printing. Some big oil companies are also experimenting. The services and parts companies have yet to get into the game. Next would be to connect up all these moving parts. Under any scenario, there will still be considerable tri a highway haulage of kit to the oil fields. Therefore, digitally connecting the haulers to each other and to an intelligent highway system, in much the same way that the air traffic control system works, could be a winner. In general, Canadian highways are pretty dumb assets. But if there's a shared asset that should attract sensor investment, it would have to be Highway 63 to Fort McMurray. Trucks that are connected to each other would be able to platoon, driving closer together with trailing trucks enslaved to the lead truck. Pl platoon trials are already underway in the United Kingdom. The data gathered from actual movements processed through AI would help identify some optimization potential. And this is not a new idea. The Norwegian offshore industry operates this way already, except their mobile assets are ships and helicopters. Next would be to unlock the physical internet. Nearly all logistics services providers and carriers operate their own proprietary physical assets, that is, warehouses, docks, and trucks, as well as their own operational assets, information about customers, routes, and markets. This model calls to mind the early days of the technology companies like IBM, HP, and DEC, who had their own walled gardens of vendor-specific technologies. This model is now credited with locking in customers, inflating cost, and stifling innovation. Logistics is now in sharp contrast to the new business model of the internet, which is a logistics system that moves data, not goods. The internet is more open, more transparent, it's global, and shared. The internet is dramatically more innovative and has grown much faster than the logistics sector. Oil companies are in some respects hostage to the legacy logistics business model design and the incumbents are structurally in a poor position to change. The technologies, though, are in place, cloud computing and apps, for oil sands companies to stand up their own joint logistics operations to challenge the incumbents. Similarly, a new entrant, like Amazon, could find fertile ground to offer oil companies a digitally enhanced logistics service. Check out Amazon's latest app, um, which is uh, an app for trucking. All of this is not a new idea either. The North Sea oil sector has started a collaborative initiative across a handful of offshore players to pool their respective critical spare parts inventories, and this is an important step to unlocking the physical internet. Next, I would bring on the robots. Remote control automation is already live in the oil sands mines. Some of the mining vehicles have no human driver in the cab. This kind of automation is rapidly coming to the transportation sector where haulers will be remote controlled. Unfortunately, there is little experimentation with this technology outside of the mining sector, and here in Canada, we are a full decade after the Australian miners made most of the first moves. How are we away from robots at, at the wheel? There is clearly a role for the Alberta government to promote the adoption of carbon-reducing transport in the province, perhaps by offering special R&D credits for early experiments, relaxing some transport rules to permit road trials, and purchasing a handful of the latest trucking technologies like Tesla's electric truck for experiments and studies through the university system. With a provincial megaton cap on carbon emissions, the industry must do everything it possibly can to remove wasted carbon emissions from the business model so that it continue to generate wealth from its oil assets. A little digital innovation in logistics could make a real difference. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.